at the very end of the Torah and the book of Deuteronomy, Rashi, our greatest commentator, um, ha has a, an extended comment, and he has one phrase that says, Lo nitna Torah ela keneged yetzer hara. The Torah was given only to combat the yetzer hara, and everything else is commentary. And I think that's a, a, a phrase that we have to take into uh, into yamim, yamim no ra'im. So I want to give you just a a little bit of an overview of uh, what I want to talk about in some uh, detail tomorrow. Uh, going along with the Hasidic idea, as I mentioned in my preface, that human transformation is a miracle, especially if it happens to you. And so we are, want to track the teachings of the past few weeks. Um, take a very, very deep breath. You assign some time and you go deep into yourself and you enter into what I would call the, the mystery of deeper consciousness. And as I've been teaching, instead of looking for the stillness of the one color, the one note, which is more of a, you know, a uh, um, transcendental meditation, this would be a more of a moving into what I call the, the vortex of the inner life, finding all of the competing forces within you. Uh, Jung would say all of the gods fighting for your attention. Even look back at your life and um, look, borrowing this idea of polytheism and idol worship, um, the inner gods that have driven you to one place or another and driven you to things, including um, addictions or semi-addictions that have taken up your energy. And you stand back and you say to yourself as you're going in there, why was that the focus of my life? Why was I pouring everything into that when I look back and you say I was frittering away my time and energy? So this deep experience of not just the un unconscious ego states, both positive and negative, I should mention, but stripping way deeper and deeper in, we enter what I call the world of the soul and just watching this activity. And the reason I recommend that is when we live life, what I call up here on the surface, we tend to forget of the raging war within us. That life on the surface is, in a sense, since we can relatively only be one person at a time, do one thing at a time, we forget that deep inside there's a battle. And what we're living up here is what you might call, metaphorically, the battlefield debris. Well, the battle's over, and this is the, the battlefield that I'm going to live in. But the, but the battle is still continuing. This is what, by the way, a very Hasidic idea, Rabbi Bratislav, is that there is number one a, a conflict of all of our vis of our visions within i talked about this on my wednesday night uh wisdom class which i you, you can still sign up for it which is how to cultivate a vision when there are so many different forces within you um and then once you cultivate the vision of course the yetzahara comes right right away in and because it has its own vision of disrupting what you want to do with your life and up here, we're just sometimes exhausted putting one foot after the other because the inner battles can be so enervating. They can just sap our energy. So I believe that one of the, th this is maybe in an artificial order, uh, but for me, week one was engaging in that work. Or the, the, the second week, as you may recall, I wanted to focus that this work always takes place in some world of symbols and narratives. And that, that's one way I define a religion when I was having this conversation and, and a person said to me, uh, you know, a person watching this other rabbi and I talk, and I mean, interest, I was making a case for Judaism while this person was making a case for university, universal, universal, universality and ethics. Um, I was saying we have to live in a somewhat dense symbolic universe to get these things done. For example, the symbol of Rosh Hashanah. And then specifically, I, I follow this the Hasidic approach. Shana meaning, one of its meanings is lishanot, to change. Lihishtanot, to transform. Another, again, symbolic meaning of Rosh Hashanah is Malchut Shemaim. We live in a world of the authority of values. You don't feel that all the time unless you actually have to take this symbolic universe and set it for yourself and say, there's a structure of the right way to live spiritually and morally, and therefore in our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And it's a structure that we live in and it has a claim on us. And every day when you wake up, you wanna remember that you live in, in a world where there's purpose, there's meaning, there's duties in life. And then you take a look at yourself and say, 
Am I snapping into this? What happened to me when I did it? What happened to me when I forgot the meaning and purpose of living with dignity and nobility and consciousness? And what happens when I do? So when I say symbolic universe, I don't just mean tangible symbols. Uh, and sometimes I especially mean the, the symbols in our uh, the, the metaphoric calendar life. The idea of Malchut Shemayim, the sovereignty of the divine. Um, the calendar metaphor of Yom Hishtanut, the day of transformation. You see, if you don't have these kinds of uh, images and metaphors and words, we're all just making putting it together haphazardly. Um, now, again, I'm, as an existentialist, I'm standing back and I'm saying, well, is there really a Yom Hishtanut engraved in the universe? I don't know, but I'm going to act as if there is. Meaning I, I don't want to um, deceive myself in saying, well, this is all absolutely true. At some point, I chose it to be true. I, you know, I'm the existentialist in me says, I've been, as it were, you know, this uh, the Heideggerian idea of thrownness. I've been thrown into a cold, heartless, meaningless universe. And therefore, I have to be the meaning maker. And I have to find other meaning makers. And for a moment, we're going to just focus on ourselves. In this cold, dark universe, we're going we're gonna to create meaning. And we're going to create worlds of meaning, but worlds of meaning are found in myths and symbols, including verbal myths and symbols, including the sacred calendar. So that's the second step that I wanted to talk about on our path to uh, Rosh Hashanah. The third step, as you uh, may recall, is my, tr my trying to talk about the various dimensions of truth. I finally got a, an AI transcription of that talk, and I want to find out what I was talking about because I liked it. And I'm going to try to make that very lucid and put it together and put it on the website because I think I had something good to say. And a lot of you were very interested in it, as I was. As I, it was one reason I think I lost my place because I got swept up into the uh, words. So if we want to start with consciousness and then look at the symbolic world that shapes consciousness, by the way, including poetry. Now, we have our sacred poetry in the Siddur, but of course, for me, any sacred poetry, including especially the poetry that Shanti brings us on Friday nights, and as well as Rilke and the others, that's choosing a symbolic universe. Um, so whenever you are taking words and myths and images and stories and ingesting them, you're creating your symbolic universe, which is why we have to take care. What do we memorize? Um, what does guide us? Because if we don't do it intentionally, it happens haphazardly. Okay, so now on this fourth Shabbos of the seven Shabbos toward Rosh Hashanah, we've entered into Elul. The next, um, borrowing from the idea we live in a world of myths and symbols, verbal, metaphoric, and tangible, is the idea of Yom Hishtanut, the day of transformation, which is when we uh, look at ourselves, we say, transformation is possible. I'll share with you another conversation, uh, two conversations I had this week. One was when... Uh, Again, when I was in this in this very friendly, informal discussion of, of Reform Judaism, and um, uh, and I talked about because Rosh Hashanah is on my mind that 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 Judaism is among many things a myth, symbol, verbal, poetic system that guides us toward uh, human transformation, mostly through again, this is the Hasidic path I mostly identified with, is sinking into the world of words. Um, and I'm going to put a capital here, going along with the Baal Shem Tov's path of every word, when you go into it, there are worlds and souls and angels. Okay. Another way he says, Olamot, Malachim, Neshamot, um, world. Somebody says Elohut. Doesn't say Elohim, doesn't say God. He says Elohut, divinity. So one thing I, I hope to do is actually take that page from Amud HaTfilah, the pillar of prayer, and, and maybe make that a focus uh, for Rosh Hashanah, which I'll talk about in a moment. And um, as we go into the, 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 you know, open up the word and you go into the depths of the word, um, it's as if the depths of the word, the, you know, the Vorta, the, the, the capital uh, W, it enters you. And then there's a process of transformation that I don't think we're in charge of, but once the some higher self opens us up to the word and the word comes into us, it's as if the higher consciousness is giving the soul the tools for transformation. I hope this isn't too arcane, but I'm, I, I want to tell you how I really think transformation happens. I think the soul does it. I mean, you can think about it all day long and you can say, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do this. And the Yetzirah just laughs and says, yeah, you got any other news for us about how you're going to change me? 
And but when you when you have this idea of there's transformation and then you give the myths and the symbols and you ingest them and you study them. Well, it's as if the conscious mind transfers them down to the soul and you're giving the soul fuel, you're giving the soul direction, you're giving the soul nourishment to get this work done. So try to imagine the soul is starving for you to provide it direction. It's a strange idea. Well, who's the you and what's the soul? I don't have, I don't want today to try to give, give that too much precision, but try to imagine when you say to the soul, transformation is possible the shows the soul says show me um help me now why because as i was talking about this a, 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 a woman in the room said um woman in her 80s she says i've had a hole in my inner life that i've been trying to fill since i was a child i've had an empty space in my inner life that i've been trying to fill since i was a child uh, the, the israeli we're speaking in hebrew she says halal, you know. As of course, you know those of you, those of you who know Kabbalah. Well, all of a sudden, like I know about the halal. I know about you know when when the in the tzimtzum when the divine, you know, withdraws. There's an empty halal. So I, I I didn't go there. And she says I've been to therapy. I've done different programs, and I can't find anything that will fill this this as we we say in twelve step programs, a god sized hole in the heart. I didn't know how to say that in Hebrew. And the person said, are you saying that Judaism addresses, I'll use the 12-step word, the God-sized hole in my heart? And it was kind of a, a, you know, a breathless moment. I said, absolutely. I can testify, right? There's a way to fill the God-sized hole in your heart. By the way, the 12-step took it from a poem that I'll talk about the high holiday. But I found that the source of that. So it's a... The, oftentimes these aphorisms are condensations of a, something a little more wordy, but sometimes poetically uh, brilliant. So I just want you to try to imagine that of all the changes we have to make on our, you know, our moral behavior, inner life behavior, managing ego states at some level, there's a God sized hole in the heart of every person that we just suffer it and go on. But that God sized hole leads to, to a lot of the, the, the destructive thoughts, feelings, emotions, speech, and behavior that we engage in. And there's a time to just address the God-sized hole in our hearts. And that is part of transformation. So the woman looked at me, she said, are you saying that Judaism can show me how to address the God-sized hole in my heart? I said, absolutely. And she shook her head in kind of disbelief. And I don't know what ever said to me. What I reason is, is because... Traditional Judaism here, Chabad, etc., they talk about making people orthodox. Some of the, the good ones talk about the God-sized hole in the heart, but there's so much between, you know, they got to be orthodox and you have to keep the six and the 13 commandments. And I'm like, look, forget about orthodoxy, forget about tradition, forget about Hashem, forget, forget about all this. Just go to straight to the God-sized hole in the heart and stay right there. And that's what, and, and also I'm going to, you know, this is a little good critique of how Reformed Judaism markets itself here, it really is a kind of an imitation of that in the States. It's all about social action, social action, social action. And when I agree, there's lots of things to work on in Israel. But what, a, what about a non-Orthodox movement that says, we're not going to talk about equal rights for the marginalized. We're not going to talk about getting rid of Netanyahu. We're not going to talk about ending the war in Gaza. Let the politicians and the newspapers talk about that. For one month, we're going to say to every Israeli, you know, putting out the newspaper, among everything else you're struggling with, you have a God-sized hole in your heart. And we, the forces of progressive Judaism here, among everything else that we do, we want to help you with this. Come to us. We have a teaching. This is a fantasy of mine because, of course, the te that teaching, which I think most rabbis know of, gets lost in all the noise. So these conversations had a big effect on me. Um, and, you know, as I say, to, okay, now we're starting Elul, what I want to teach about. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why it's so important in just a moment. I want to talk about that. Right? I, I, I found a poetic image. Uh, now, the poetic image of the God-sized hole in our hearts, I can find that in Hasidut. I can find that in Kabbalah. One way that Hasidu talks about it is the kera, a kuf resh ayin, the terror in the heart, that there's a terror. 
and it's a painful tear and you don't know how to fix the tear you don't know how to stitch the tear so you just go on with your life and then in deep moments you're aware of the tear and the, and the tear is 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 pushing you this way and pushing you that way and you say this awkward thing and you find your thoughts feelings and emotions and you go back to yourself and you go deep inside and say there's a tear in me and i need to work on it so we have the inner life the tear the symbol system well, there's a calendar and a metaphor called the day of uh, of transformation. It really, I mean, what, what kinds of truth are there? How can you demonstrate this? Isn't truth the empirical correspondence there? No, there's something else called life truth, and we're hitting a life truth moment. Um, we're 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 born into the world of brokenness, and there's a way through. And Rosh Hashanah is a huge step in the uh, way through. So my theme for uh, today, as we are entering into uh, Rosh Hashanah, Hasidically, Rosh meaning beginning of, or the you know the the the, the fountain uh, head of a of a of a river, Shana not meaning year, but Hishtanut change, and uh, I just want us to all imagine, even playfully, there's a day coming up, and the day has power. It's like you're walking into a room, you know, a, a calendrical room. And you open that door, and when you walk in, if you're ready, if you've done the work, the day does it for you. The day does it for you. Now, is this true? I don't know. Maybe it's, it's worth giving it a shot. What if you did all this work, and you study the poetry, and you mastered the images, and you got your heart ready, and you focus and says, okay, here's this day. It's the first of Elul. I'm walking in, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring myself there. And you call up the divine presence that says, let's get to work. And you stay focused on that for that day.